Early this year, I was in Shenzhen and Hong Kong, and uh, the Christmas songs filled the air. Um, they were not exactly singing the way that we sing in church. And uh, of course, the whole reason was that uh, they were celebrating Christmas in a business way. Um, I would like to show you what I had seen in Hong Kong as our first uh, slide. And uh, that is what Christmas, how Christmas was spent in Hong Kong. The uh, place was totally decked with uh, goodies. And incidentally, I understand that um, in the place of Yi Wu in China, they manufacture 75% of all the Christmas decorations used all over the world. And uh, so if you can imagine, uh, if uh, during the next election that comes around in, in, in uh, 2020, and China chooses to shut down that factory, I think the American population will be in a total uproar. And that would have been a good weapon for them. So I went over to Sunchen, and just as much in Sunchen, uh, the, the deck was placed, it was filled with uh, Christmas decorations. And uh, so it was just uh, on and on that uh, Christmas became very much a business. I'm reminded of a story of a teacher who was teaching the Christmas story during Christmas. And uh, he, she had um, pulled out a $10 note and said to the class, if anyone can tell me who the greatest man is who lived on earth, he will have this $10. And so one boy said, Michelangelo. Well, Michelangelo was a great painter. Uh, painter. Then he said, Aristotle. Aristotle was a great philosopher. Both answers were wrong. Then one little boy put up his hand and said, Jesus Christ. And the teacher was so enlightened and said, that's absolutely correct. Here's your $10. And uh, then during the break time, as the teacher was thinking about it, that boy who answered Jesus Christ was a Jewish boy. And uh, so she went out and uh, asked her, him the question. Now, why did you say Jesus Christ? You are Jewish. She says, oh, well, we all know it's Solomon or King David or anyone else. But you know, business is business. America spends a lot of money uh, during the time of, uh, of uh, Christmas. Obama, the president of the United States before uh, <laughs> President Trump, had said that we should never address anyone Merry Christmas because that will offend the religions around that were being practiced. But you should say, Happy Holidays. And uh, that really meant nothing. The American Civil Liberties Union said that the church is encroaching upon Christmas. In other words, saying there's too much of it, celebration of Christmas, that they should not even have entertained it. <coughs> now, when Trump came into power, of course he said, Everyone should say Merry Christmas or Blessed Christmas because that's the very reason why Christmas is for. Christmas is for the celebration, the commemoration of the birth of Jesus Christ on this earth. So go ahead and say Merry Christmas. So when we were in the States just a few weeks ago, <coughs> we had, in fact, talked to uh, several people and, and even in the, in, the, in the stores, they were saying, Merry Christmas for the first time in eight years. And uh, so it became Merry Christmas for sure. Now, some of us may write the word Merry uh, Christmas with an X, like X-M-A-S. Am I right? Yes. Yeah, you know what X stands for? Under the Cambridge English Dictionary, X is donates a person who has no name. So when you say ex Christmas, you're not acknowledging Christ in Christmas. And so let's not be thinking about it. So easy for us to put Xmas uh, when we write Christmas. 
and it's kind of an abbreviated form of Christmas. All right. Now, C.S. Lewis was a man, a writer, and he was a man who said, it is natural for babies to take mother's milk without knowing the mother. What does it mean? Today, well, last week, I think, the Court of Appeal in Singapore held that it was okay to adopt a child born through a homosexual in a relationship with another and uh, said that uh, it was okay that, that we should acknowledge the adoption as being good for the boy. And uh, so, we come to a point where we say, if a child is being born out of a surrogate mother, even though the child takes the milk of the mother, he does not know who the giver is. In other words, who donated the sperm. In a literal sense, that is what it is. If you cannot understand who the, fa the father is, then you cannot understand who the giver of life is. And so it is for Christians today to acknowledge that as we begin to celebrate Christmas, acknowledge who the giver of life is. Jesus came into this world in order to save life. And so Christmas is all about sacrifice. Christmas is all about the crucifixion. And so as we begin to realize that this is what Christmas is about, that we need to understand the very person that gave us life is Jesus Christ. Then we begin to understand that Christmas is not about revelry, drinks, parties, gifts, and everything else. But understand that the donor is the person that we should be looking at. Now, having said all that, let's now turn to what do we do during this Christmas time? During this Christmas time, we think about the shepherds. We think about Zacharias. We think about Joseph. And we think about Mary. The angels were being commissioned by God to speak to these four sets of people. And of course, later on, in two years later, we, they spoke also to the kings. But understand that, first of all, when they spoke to Zacharias, Zacharias was a religious teacher. Zacharias was a teacher who, who, who made offerings in the temple. And Zacharias was a very religious person. The Bible tells us that both Zacharias and the wife, Elizabeth, they were all in age, they were all old in, in their age. And so when, when, the, when the angel appeared to Zacharias, Zacharias was in the holy temple, and Zacharias was making offerings to the Lord. And when Zacharias spoke, uh, heard the angel, the angel appeared before him. The words that the angel that Zacharias said was he was afraid. And the angel said, do not be afraid. Now you'll find these words being repeated again and again. Do not be afraid, spoken to, the, um, to Zacharias. It was spoken to Mary. It was spoken to Joseph. And it was spoken to the shepherds. Do not be afraid. Now when we get the message today, I want to suggest to you that some of you may be afraid. Afraid of various things, afraid of your health, afraid of the burdens that have befallen you. It may be too heavy a burden. Afraid of the fact that your health is failing. Afraid of the, what the future is going to hold for you. When the, when the angel said to Zacharias, do not be afraid, he was bringing a message to Zacharias. He says, do not be afraid. Do you not know that, there will, that your wife will conceive Conceive a boy who will eventually be called John the Baptist. And he was going to be a forerunner of the Son of God, of Jesus Christ. And that was very important for, for Zacharias to know that he was going to be the father of somebody who was going to bring the good news of the coming Savior. Zacharias did not believe. And so the angel said, because you don't believe, you're going to be struck down. You cannot speak. There are no words that have come out of your mouth. And so when he emerged from the, tem from the inner temple to the outer, he, he was not able to speak. And so they were all very amazed. 
Well, before long, the wife conceived and bore a child. In the sixth month, the same angel called Gabriel went over to Mary. And Mary, according to the, 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 the Bible, says Mary was a highly favored person. She was totally recognized as being um, suitable for the, the Holy Spirit to bear, the, to, to, to go into her and, and bear a child. And the child was going to be called Jesus. And so Mary was being spoken to again. She was afraid. But there was a difference between her fear and the fear of Zacharias. In the case, she was a woman, a young girl probably at 16 years of age, but she knew scripture because the Bible speaks to it that, that she was quoting scripture. And the other difference of it, of it was that she knew that as she bore the child of Jesus Christ, it was not going to be where she was going, it was going to be an ordinary child. And then she began to ask that question. As she rightly said, a lot of very learned people today would ask that question. Is it true that, that, that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary? And that kind of a question was being asked by all sorts of scholars even today. Even in the seminaries of the world, even in the Bible colleges of the world, they ask the same question. Is it true that Jesus could be born of the Virgin Mary? Now that question must have filled Mary's mind herself because she asked the angel, how can it be? I'm a virgin, I'm, I know nobody. So how could I even have the possibility of, of bearing a child? Mary's fear was justified. But the angel said, you are favoured by, by the Lord and that you will be conceived a baby born of the Holy Spirit. And so Mary was so enlightened, that she said, I give all glory to God that, she has, that he has chosen me to be a, cho a, a vessel worthy of bearing the child of the Savior of the world. And then there was Joseph. Joseph had gone to Bethlehem. There was this wife of his, betrothed, no doubt. The question is being used, uh, where question, where, whether or not she was in fact his wife already, but the Bible says that she had only become um, engaged to Joseph. And so what would they do? Because the law requires that if a woman is pregnant during her engagement period, she would have to be put to death. And that was not what Joseph's desire was. And so Joseph was very troubled. He went to sleep. And during his sleep, an angel appeared to him and said, fear not and began to ensure him that what he was doing was the correct thing to do, to marry Mary and to take her as his wife. And so as he woke up from the dream, he accepted Mary as his wife. That fear was, again, a justifiable fear, because what could, she, what could he do when he had never even uh, had any relationship with, the, with Mary and uh, so she conceived? But he nonetheless, he took the child into, uh, as, as, his, as his child. Then we have got the shepherds. The angels appeared before the shepherds. And there are two significant things that you have to remember. Number one is that the shepherds were old, very simple folks. They were also very smelly folks. Smelly because they were always looking after the sheep. And I would have news for you. Christmas is not December the 25th. We just use December 25th as a date for us to celebrate. But it's sometime in the spring, because it's during the spring that the sheep give birth to the lamb. And it was always during the time of the sacrifice, near enough to Jerusalem, to the place of sacrifice. And so when the sheep uh, bore a child, bore a lamb rather, that lamb would be sacrificed. And it was during this time that Jesus Christ was born. So it was not December the 25th, it is sometime uh, 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 later than that, in the springtime. And uh, so when uh, the shepherd, when the, when the angel appeared to the shepherd, 
The Bible says they were really afraid. Afraid, why? Because all of a sudden there was a whole host of angels all around. And it says, Behold, I give you good tidings of great joy, which shall be all people, shall be to all people. For there shall be born in, the, in, 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 in Bethlehem, in a place, in the cradle, where Jesus, where the baby would be uh, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in the manger. And so they heard this very significant verse. This very significant. Just understand that during that this was the time when the first Christmas message was ever preached. It was preached not by man, it was preached by an angel. And it was preached in an open air. And it was preached during the night. Now, what is significant about the night was that the night represented the loop, the gloom and the doom of time. And it was during that time that Jesus was declared to be born. During the midst of all the violence and difficulties of our lives, the world being in chaos, that there's a time when the Saviour came into the world. And that becomes significant for us to know that it was not just uh, the night the factor of the night, but it was also the fact that it was <coughs> it was during uh, the, the it was declared to the shepherds being the simplest folks. What was significant as a character, as a virtue of the shepherds, is the fact that they were all prepared to listen. If you are prepared to listen to a Christmas message the way that is being declared in the Bible, then you understand the true meaning of Christmas. As I said to you in, in Sunchen and in Hong Kong, I mean, de decorations all over the place, songs fill the air, even carols. <laughs> they had a carol, O come all ye faithful. Let us adore him. Did they even know the meaning of being adoring the Lord? And we pray that sometimes when the Spirit seeps into one's spirit, that the whole message is being related. And so, what are angels? Angels are spiritual beings. Angels are created by God. Angels are God's messengers, and angels are the ministering spirits. Dr. Billy Graham, in one of his messages, spoke about two instances which the wife, Ruth Graham, experienced in China. That was where she was born. And it was during that period of time that uh, they, 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 they were in the village, staying in the village, ministering to... The father was a doctor, ministering to the, the villagers. And there was a woman who was in that village that preached to her about Jesus Christ. She had not accepted Jesus Christ yet. Then one day, a tiger came out of the jungle and attacked her. And all she could do was to cry out, Jesus, save me. And miraculously, the tiger just turned away. Because what happened was that God dispatched an angel to protect her from that danger. Billy Graham also talked about another story of a very famous neurologist. This neurologist said that one night, he had a, a knock on his door, consistently knocking on his door. And he opened the door. And there was a four-year-old girl who pulled the doctor and said, please come and help my mother. She is very sick. And so pulled him by the hand and went to the house. And true enough, the mother was very ill. And he had time enough to call the ambulance. And as he was in the ambulance with that mother, he asked the lady, who is that four-year-old girl? He said, which four-year-old girl? The mother asked. That four-year-old girl who knocked on my door. 
that four-year-old girl who told me that, that you were sick. And that's why I'm here. This, I don't have a four-year-old girl. I don't have a four-year-old daughter. She died a month ago. And if you went back to the house, you would see her clothes there. The doctor, out of curiosity, went back to the house and saw the clothes in the cupboard. The exact clothes that this young girl was wearing when she knocked on the door of the neurologist. God had dispatched an angel to him. When we were in, my wife and I were in, in America about a week ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I've forgotten. But there was this wildfire, this forest fire, raging through the hills of Los Angeles. And there was, <coughs> there was a, a story in the Bible, uh, in the newspapers, that spoke about this particular fire and spoke about the story of this woman, this, this lady called Deborah. And Deborah had four girls, ages from four to 14. And when the fire engulfed the house, together with all the others, she took her, her four-year-old girl out and brought her out to the house to safety. The 14-year-old girl followed the mother. Then there was the eight-year-old and the nine-year-old girls still in the house. And as the mother was preparing to dash back into the house to take the children out, the fire was so strong and it was impossible for her to even go through the first veil of the fire. And she looked at the fire. And there, out of the fire, a man holding two girls' heads came out. Her seven and her eight and a nine-year-old daughters being brought out. And as the girls hugged the mother, the mother turned around to thank this man and he was nowhere to be found. Coming out of the fire, God had dispatched an angel to save the girls. So we talk about angels because the Bible says that they are ministering spirits and they could be in the form of a human being. They could be in the form of a person, but they were also in the form of spirits. And one could not deny the fact that today, and I'm going to close with some stories about it, today, we find that angels appear to all of us. Now, the Bible says, do not be afraid. I'm going to talk to you about why it is that we fear. When, we, when I was ministering to somebody not too long ago, he was fearful of the fact that his sins had not been forgiven. He had doubts that God had forgiven him. In fact, the person I was ministering to was very dear to me. And uh, I had to assure him that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, when he accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, his sins were forgiven. And you'd be surprised in some of the meetings that I had attended. For example, one meeting in, in, in Amsterdam where 10,000 evangelists were gathered. They were not even sure, some of these evangelists were not even sure about their salvation. They went to Billy Graham one night and said, Dr. Graham, we've asked people to accept Jesus Christ, but we've never ourselves said, Jesus, please forgive me. Jesus is my Lord. Dr. Graham was so surprised. So the very next day, before the whole assembly of 10,000 evangelists, he said, this is what happened last night. And uh, if you are not sure of your salvation, if you're not sure that your sins have been forgiven, I invite you to come to the front. 200 pastors who were evangelists came to the front and said, we are not sure that our sins have been forgiven. 
Now, that is not something that is perhaps out of the blue unusual. What we are saying, and, and as your pastor Francis would, would tell you whenever he goes to a crusade, it was a, always a repetition of, have you been saved? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Have your sins been forgiven? And invariably, there will be people coming forward to say, to say, we don't really know whether our sins have been forgiven. I want to say this to you this morning, on a Christmas morning. Are you sure in your own heart that Jesus Christ died for you? You see, there is no Christmas without the crucifixion. There is no birth without the death. And Jesus came to die for us. And if we are not aware of that, then we do not know the message of Christmas. So I want to say this to you too, that when later on when we call for you to, to commit yourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ in a fresh way, that you bear this in mind. The fear of health is also another issue. People fear their health. We've got a friend who has uh, been diagnosed with cancer. He fears his, his, the, 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 the length and longevity of his life. And he's very fearful. And there are many of us who, at some point or other, when we grow sick, we are fearful of the fact that this, this fear, this, this uh, sickness might just increase and, and take us beyond the point of no return. Is that something that we are in fear of? Some of us may be in fear of our future, not knowing what's going to be, whether it's going to be one thing or the other. I see advertisements in a, a, a trailer in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, our local, local television, CNA, Channel News Asia, and it shows about this man who was being told one day that he had lost his job. And of course, the hero came around in shining armour and said, I'll find you another job. There's another job going for you. But the fact of the matter is that as we go along and things become more difficult, the, the authorities, the leaders have told us that, that 2019 is going to be even more difficult than 2018. And we do not know what's in store. And yet, we begin to worry, what, what's it going to be for us? What's our future going to be? And yet, there are some others who have got fear. Fear that you've got so many burdens. Fear of finance, fear of this, that, or the other. And somehow, rather, the, the, the fear grows into so many areas and so many things that uh, you have never envisaged it before. But that fear comes up to you. The angels came to Zacharias, to Joseph, to Mary, to the shepherds. Do not fear. Do not worry. Don't fear about it because it's going to be um, okay for you. And Hannah, if that's warm water, I'll take it. I think I caught this cold in Hong Kong. And I'm trying to suppress that, that cough. Mary placed her faith over her fear. Mary placed her faith over her fear. There's a saying that fear um, tolerated Fear tolerated is faith corrupted. I like that. Fear tolerated is faith corrupted. In other words, you don't believe in faith. That, that's a corruption of your whole definition of faith because you fear. And if there is fear, then faith is being corrupted. And I think we can remember that in, in, in the walk with, in, of our lives. Do you know that when we are all born, we are born without fear? Is that going to be a surprising statement? Fear is acquired. 
when you find a baby crawling towards the balcony, is the baby fearful? No. When he touches in the, uh, the fireplace and he touches the fire, or he walks towards the fire, crawls towards the fire, he's not afraid. Because there is no sense of fear in a person who is born. And when we are born anew and afresh, that fear should not be with us. And so let us just absorb this. If there's nothing else you can understand out of my message, absorb the fact that God does not allow us to have fear in our lives. Because that fear is replaced by faith. And so when fear comes on, it is faith corrupted. So let's all remember that and just dispel in the name of Jesus the fear that may come to us. Now, you may be surprised that there is um, a passage in the scripture which talks about angels, particularly in, re in reference to a person who is dying or who is dead. Angels are being assigned to each and every one of us. Do you know that there are thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of angels in the book of Revelation? And in fact, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, you remember how Peter had chopped off the ear of a, of, of, of a, uh, a soldier? And how, how Jesus said, don't do anything, don't be violent. If I need, I can call legions of angels to come and fight this battle. You don't have to be, be doing that just as one person or, or 12 of you or 11 of you, rather, at that point of time. Because there are legions of angels all around. And so I'm here to say to you that we all have angels assigned to us, those of us who are faithful and those of us who are believers. The Bible talks about Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus and the rich man, Lazarus was a poor beggar, eating off the crumbs of the rich man's table. They both died. The, 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 the rich man went to hell. Lazarus went to the bosom of Abraham, went to heaven. And so the rich man said, please come and help me. If you can't help me, help tell my brothers that they should not live the life that I lived. And so, The angel said to the rich man, that is not possible. Because if you're on this earth and you do not receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your time is gone. What I'm going to say to you about this story is additionally another reason. And what is that reason? What is the thing that I'm telling you? Tell you? That angels actually carry us into heaven. You read from Lazarus, from, from the book of Lazarus, uh, chapter 16, verse 22. The words they said was that the angel carried Lazarus to the bosom of Abraham. Angels are going to be assigned to you the day that you close your eyes to carry you to the bosom of Abraham. Dr. Billy Graham said, you see, if somebody tells you that Billy Graham has died, do not believe it. It's fake news. Because I have been, I'm more alive today than I was before. It's only that I've changed my address. <laughs> this is where we all change our addresses. My brother was a very devout person very much a person who loved the Lord and who served the Lord without any limitation. I know that Brother Francis and I go to him for consultation sometime, some, for some, at some point of time because he was that kind of a person. He was really, I won't use the word religious, he was really disciplined to follow Jesus Christ. 
in all his ways. No exception. He was a man who was a chaplain to the prisoners, and he looked after the ex-prisoners. And he was a man who, in, in history, brought education to the prisons in Singapore. The first man. And it was as a result of educate, educating the prisoners that some of them had graduated to uh, A-levels, to, to universities, and uh, some of them were now holding very high positions in government and in the, in, in, in the marketplace. Henry Ku was that kind of a man. When he was sick, a doctor had accidentally punctured his lungs and was lying in the hospital. And he knew that his time, his days were numbered. But he was asking God, God, give me some more years. Like, like King Hezekiah, give me some more years before you take me home. We were visiting him and one day, he said, can you give me some drawing pad? Because I see Jerusalem. I see a beautiful city. And I want to draw that city. And so we gave him the, writing, the, the drawing pad and, and, and pencils and all that. And then one day following that, he said to the Lord in his prayer, he says, Lord, I want to go home. And what he meant was going back to his physical home to see his wife and his children. I want to go home. And the Lord spoke to him and said, yes, you're going to go home. And in a few days, the Lord dispatched an angel to carry Henry Ku back home to heaven. So we never know what it means for us to face the end days of our lives. Because God is saying, I will dispatch an angel to take you to heaven. That story of Lazarus and, uh, and the rich man, the angel came down to dispatch Lazarus and to carry him. Some, 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 some translation says to rush him, to carry him. Angels are to carry him to the bosom of Abraham. And angels will be dispatched to carry you to heaven to be united with the loved ones and the faithful ones who had gone home to be with the Lord. And so I'm saying to you, brothers and sisters, the Christmas angel, as in other angels, is real to every one of us. Now, that's obviously a conflict because the Bible tells us that one-third of the angels fell from heaven, led by Lucifer. And, and there are these angels that are always fighting us, are always luring us, always bringing us into all sorts of addictions and, and all sorts of evil. But God has his angels to dispatch to us. How many do we want? We only need one angel. When Billy Graham said he was going to the pulpit at any crusade, he said it was as though the angel had lifted me up to the platform, given me an injection of energy, and the Holy Spirit gave me the whole portion of his double anointing. That was Billy Graham, a man who you think would just get onto the platform and preach. But he said, no. He said, it was the angel that brought him up, gave him the restoration, gave him the energy, and the Holy Spirit giving him the anointing to speak the word of God. So we are here today celebrating Christmas. And I want to show with you the last slide that speaks to the way that the angels uh, spoke to the people in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, in fact, it's in your program. But it's a wonderful statement because the angel said, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, 
mighty God, everlasting Father, everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And what is declared to us is that He's coming here to our lives as a wonderful counsellor, as a mighty God, as a Prince of Peace, and as the King of Kings. And so as we declare that to Him today, I want to really address you and say that believe that God is ministering to you, those who are faithful to Him, those who look at Him and say, I really need you. I know that Brother Francis and I can cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, you send an angel to encourage us. You send an angel to hold us. You know, the angels were going alongside Jesus all of his life, except one time. And you know when that one time was? That one time was when Jesus was dying on the cross. And he said, I've got to bed all by myself. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed to his father and said, Lord, if it be willing, let this cup pass over me, but not my will, but thine be done. And so when he was on the cross, he had to bear it all by himself. And we ask our angel to be with us at all times, to comfort us, to direct us, to give us that peace in our hearts. And I'm saying that when Dr. Billy Graham preached his one message on angel, he said he had more letters being received out of that one message than in all the messages that he had preached. And as a result of that, he had to write a book. And the book is called Angel. And uh, if you go to the bookstore and if it's still available, I'm not sure if it's out of print, but there was the book written on angels to assure us, to declare to us that when we are faithful to God, He will send His angel to be with us. Who do you think would multiply the empty seats here, would fill the empty seats here in this church? The angel bringing the people to occupy the seats. Who do you think would answer to your various problems in your life? The angel. Not angel as a person, as a spiritual being, but angel as a messenger, as a secret agent for God the Father Almighty. And that's what I want you to take away today on this Christmas day. I want to pray for you. Because unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. He shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. And if you want that measure of faith to rise up within you, this is a good time at Christmas to declare that there is no fear and that faith takes over that fear that is in our lives. I'd like to pray for you. If you are touched by that message, I would say to you, let's declare our commitment to Jesus Christ all over again. If you have not received Jesus Christ into your Lord and Savior, as your Lord and Savior, this is the time for you to do it. So there are two altar calls to be very specific. The first one is you have not declared Jesus at all as your Lord and Savior. And I said to you, don't take it for granted. Because when, when Billy Graham had his, uh, his 10,000 evangelists, 200 came forward to say, we are not sure of our salvation. And if that's where you are, you are not sure of your salvation, and you want to declare today that Jesus Christ is truly the Savior of the world and the Master of your life, then that's the first altar call. And if that is where you are, I want you, I want to pray for you. The second one is to pray that today you would receive Jesus Christ as a person 
who saves your life and who directs your life through the third person, the Holy Spirit. And that's a renewal of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we clear on these two altar calls? I'll repeat one again. So that at, the call, at, at this altar call, if that's your desire, I want you to put up your hand. Put up your hand and maybe at some point you come forward. Is that what it is? I'll, I'll leave that to you, okay. That you stay where you are because we don't want too much of a confusion. There's going to be a little lunch over there. And uh, so I want to have you be sure of the fact that you have not really been sure that your sins have been forgiven. That's between you and the Lord, and it's very sacred. So I want all heads to be bowed, all eyes to be closed totally, except for Brother Francis and I, uh, and, and Adrian. You can look around if you like. Worship team, you can come forward now. But I want you guys to close your eyes too, okay? Because I want this to be a moment when God is going to speak to you. You are not sure that your sins have been forgiven. You are not sure that God has saved you. And you want to make this commitment. Like the 200 pastors at this big convention of 10,000 evangelists. All heads bow, all eyes closed. Don't look at anyone else. And if that is your desire, I want you to put up your hand and stay your hand quickly. Uh, stay your hand until uh, the leaders have seen your hand. Is there anyone else? Yes, I see one hand. Anyone else? I see another hand back there. Anyone else? Anyone else? Very quickly before I close. I can't see behind the pillar, but is there someone? Adrian, you can see. It's important, I see your hand over there, sister. It's important that we know that our sins have been forgiven once and for all. Have no doubts in our mind. Put that fear aside and let that faith rise up within us. And that's what it is. The three of you have put up your hands. Anyone else? Anyone else? You're not sure of your sins being forgiven. And you want it to be sure. You put up your hand and I'll pray for you. Okay. I want the three to repeat this prayer. But I want the rest of you to join in as well. To encourage the three of, you, of them. Okay. Father, thank you for sending Jesus to be in this world to stand for our sins, that our sins can be forgiven. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for guiding us. And now we admit that we have doubts in our minds that you are our Lord and Saviour. We affirm it now without any doubt that you are in our lives. And so we confess that we shall walk in a way that you have led us by dying on the cross for us, a life of righteousness. And we thank you. In the, name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And now, devil, now, devil in, Jesus name, in Jesus' name, take your filthy hands off me, take your filthy hands off, me. Off, my off my family, off my, family. Off my loved ones, off my loved ones. This, day forth, this day forth, and forever. And forever. Amen. Amen. Now, for those who want to reaffirm your faith in Jesus Christ, knowing that a, an angel will be dispatched to be alongside you as the angel was alongside Jesus during his ministry. If that's your desire, and I'm sure we all desire an angel in our lives, right? 
to carry us from this place right up to heaven. And you've never heard this theology, I guarantee you it's all in the book. And I've not spoken out of turn because I've researched and done this myself. In fact, I'm preaching a series of four messages on angels, but that's beside my, what I'm saying to you right now. Angels are for real. They are ministering spirits that God the Father has sent down to this earth to help us. If it's your desire to recommit your lives to Jesus Christ, being assured that an angel is by your side, I want you to put up your hand right now. I want to pray for you all over. I believe that. Yes. Father, you've seen these hands, Lord. Father, you know that these are hands of people who desire that their faith be increased in their lives to believe and to walk the way that you have led them to do, to banish all fears out of their lives and to let faith replace it in the name of Jesus. I thank you for my brothers. I thank you for my sisters. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that this message will seep through their spirit over and over again, that they know that your angels are dispatched to help us in this life. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. And all together we shall say...